morning and welcome to Rising. We have a smashing show for you today. Brianna, what do we have? <laughs> well, the New York Times is reporting that Europe's economy is taking a nosedive amid the war in Ukraine. That's, quote, literally posing a threat to the country's living standards and industry. We discussed earlier this week how Russian sanctions have backfired and caused a spike in energy prices, some of the highest inflation rates uh, in their own risk of recession. The Times said this, quote, several countries, including Germany, the region's largest economy built up a decades long dependency on Russian energy. Now an 80 percent increase in prices presents a historic threat in Europe as plans for factory closings, rolling blackouts and rationing are being drawn up in case of severe shortages this winter. Now, the UK government announced a freeze on gas and electricity bills for the average household at 2,500 pounds a year for the next two years. Meanwhile, the EU is seeking mandatory cuts in electricity use during peak hours. Here's the EU Commission president yesterday using some familiar messaging on the proposal. And this is what is expensive because in these peak demands, the expensive gas comes into the market. So what we have to do is flatten the curve and uh, avoid the peak demands, we will propose a mandatory target for reducing electricity use at peak hours, and we will work very closely with the member states to achieve this. Interesting to hear that flatten the curve uh, <laughs> rhetoric. Uh, someone of my ideological bent might say that we were being prepared to accept you know, shutdowns and limitations and things, that COVID was a test run for a, a society or a, that's more greatly managed by government and, and has more infringements on your rights and when you're allowed to water your grass or, or you know, turn on the sprinklers well, or use energy. Well, or Robbie, or look, that, that's the terminology thermostat. that's used in, in times of scarcity. And I think we should mm -hmm. look at and point to the source of the cause of the scarcity in the first instance. You know. If there's a pandemic, obviously you do want to minimize the number of people who are getting ill and at the time earlier in COVID dying from it. In this case, this is an economic uh, issue that is really pointed. But what is interesting here is that unlike in the United States of America, they are flattening the curve by simply capping out of pocket energy costs at an enormous expense to the government. But they are saying we are going to subsidize mm -hmm. the cost here in a way that when we bring it up in the United States, is considered to be, you know, the height of socialism, even though it was the very policy that very much Republican Richard Nixon implemented in the 1970s, as uh, we had a, a guest Richard Wolf talk about uh, just last week. But all of this comes after Putin threatened to cut off all energy supply if Western countries imposed a price cap on Russian oil and gas. And China is seizing an, the opportunity for cheap gas, according to Bloomberg. China is lapping up liquefied natural gas shipments from Russia for a bargain. That allows China to then resell the gas to Europe and Asia at premium prices. Which which just <laughs> eliminates, it defeats the purpose entirely. <laughs> it eliminates the whole thing. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to um, uh, uh, buy from you because we're mad at you. So they'll sell to China, but we're still going to buy to China. It's so stupid. The idea it shows that, how econ yeah. economically destructive and I I impoverishing, immiserating these policies are. Yeah, the idea that there was an ethical source of gas when we know that the whole the whole planet is ruled by the OPEC cartel was really a kind of silly misnomer to begin with. And again, I think I did a, a radar a couple of months ago, uh, teeing up the human rights abuses and the issues that we should have with Saudi Arabia, with all of the issues that we have or are said to have in this moment with Russia. And it's, it's the idea that you're playing favorites between these two sources of oil and deciding that you're going to sanction and, and kind of um, publicly villainize Russian oil mm -hmm. specifically for this crime and not all of the crimes that Saudi Arabia has undergone is really, it, 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 dis, it displays the kind of uh, mercenary I mean, root of all of our foreign policy. The leaders of the world, including the leaders of our government, the leaders of European countries, the leaders of Russia, and the leaders of China, are all mutually deciding to make us all more miserable and poorer for their various geopolitical ambitions. Yeah, and, pro and profit, and profit. Let's not forget the extent to which price gouging has been a big part of both this oil story and a lot of the other uh, prices that continue to be high, even though many of the supply chain issues I mean, that have, caused them have diminished. You could have profit and less suffering, though. You could have... Do you have a, a certain degree? The profits are high because their but, embargoes are being placed and they're trying to get around them. But that's actually not true. As we discussed a little bit on this show, there has been uh, a lot of reporting in 
you know, research that shows that the extreme profits that companies have seen during the course of the pandemic go way beyond profit. It's price gouging. It's a term with a real meaning, which means that companies are using the cover of there being a supply chain crisis to raise prices and keep them high because they know they can justify it. And ordinarily, the consumer base would get very angry, you know, boycott products, you know, and other product other companies would compete and undersell them. But this is the problem. Markets aren't neat and markets aren't efficient. And the reality well, the is they use the cover of these kind operate. of political I mean, moments. They have, but, uh, the government is prohibiting who you can buy stuff from, where you can, you know, what you can do, that you're not having markets operate. So, yes, the markets are all out of sorts. Well, I'm talking specifically about price gouging and people who have, you know, there was just a market call. I mean, who was reporting about this? As a response there, to... No, there was, there was just a market call. This was reported, if not yesterday, then earlier this week, that people who listened to the, the 3M um, corporate call noticed that they were saying, um, congratulations for pushing up prices on these materials. So no, they, they're literally slapping themselves on the back for keeping prices high on, in this case, they, they manufacture masks. So in this case, literally, you know, tools, PP, E that are keeping people safe in the context of the pandemic, saying, you know, we, we have we've resolved a lot of these issues that artificially were keeping uh, prices high because of supply chain, and now we're going to continue to keep them high to squeeze as much out of the public as we can in this moment. That's been happening with oil. We saw earlier in this year, you remember, we talked about this, that the price of oil per barrel was not correlated to what was happening at the pump because, again, they knew that all of the kind of public conversation about supply chain issues enabled them under the, the cloak of night to continue to keep prices high. My understanding is that to the consumer. You price gouging or the sudden increases in prices are, F, are, are an economic um, development to keep down. Uh, you'll have shortages if you don't do that because if there, look if there's more people who want the thing than there is the thing available, they raise the prices and I, then some I people stop buying and you have shortages. Is. I see what the misunderstanding. So raising prices in general profit is different than price gouging. Definitionally, price gouging is when people raise prices more than they need to to turn a profit and keep them high in order to I don't think that's what people describe as price usually it, it quite I've heard, literally is. I've heard price gouging um, you know referred to like when, when there's rushes on products during uh, during weather emergencies and things like that so they say they're price gouging well that's because there's gonna be lines out the door for this product unless they raise the price no, of su it. supply and demand I, I'm describing a very specific phenomenon Robbie I'm and again the same phenomenon. this is three no when you have people admitting on their market calls that they are intentionally keeping profits higher than they need to turn a profit, they're, they're keeping prices rather higher than they need to turn a profit because they know they can get away with it. That is a very different thing than saying, oh, they got to do what they got to do. And in fact, if we're going to talk about the kinds of things people have done in emergencies, emergencies like the ones Europe is going through right now, where they're facing winter, it's a country where during the summer they experience a lot of harm because they don't have, you know, they have had a, a hotter than usual summer. They don't have air conditioner. Now they're going into a uh, because they don't, it doesn't get that hot in many places there. Now they're going into the winter when they actually do rely on their heating systems and they simply aren't going to be able to afford oil because of the prices of oil. The country is getting access to the oil so there's not exactly the supply but chain issue, but it is very expensive. Artificial constraints are being placed on the supply of all these things by government policy. We could keep prices down more if we were not sanctioning Russia. If, I mean, if, if of, course, of course that's true, Robbie, but... Russia has nothing to do with what's going on with the mask manufacturers' prices. But mask manufacturers are intentionally, intentionally driving up profit at a time when historically, what I was trying to get to before is that historically, in during times of, of crisis and war like what Europe is experiencing, what you had was companies, the government, frankly, capping the extent to which these people could raise prices to prevent price gouging. Of course, they're not trying to drive businesses out of business. That doesn't help anybody if the people can't manufacture the goods that you need in the first place. And you need you need the working the workforce to actually still get paid. But what they did was they capped the price of goods because they understood that there is a point beyond the profit that you need to keep your, your business going, that ultimately comes out of the pocket of the average worker during a moment of crisis. And you can disagree on a policy level. You can decide and sit here and say that you think infinite profit is a good thing for the world, even in the time of crisis Brianna, where people are hurting. But that is literally what some government Brianna, if they to charge, stop and If you prevent. charge something, if you charge more for something that people are willing to pay for, someone else can come along, offer the good at a lower at a lower price, that's, that's unless the there's an point, artificial Robbie. constraint on the supply no. of it, usually because of government uh, <laughs> subsidies or embargoes or regulations to stop 
people from competing. Right, but the whole That's point is what the it is every time. Cartel, the whole point. Well, that is a of, government of, managed cartel on a, a artificial constraint on supply. I don't care if the government or not, Robbie. I'm not like allergic. I'm not married to the government. The government isn't my best friend. The saying it's the government doesn't make me like it. The point is that these are government. Court cartels, the OPEC cartel, uh, all of the uh, anti-monopoly laws we have are because companies work together to agree to keep their prices in lockstep to screw over the consumer. This is like basic anti-monopoly, uh, antitrust law. This is what I mean, happens in America. But the reason we're at the mercy of this cartel is because we don't have enough alternatives domestically, or we're we're, we're sanctioning or refusing to gauge in yes, and that's energy the whole trade point with of the other anti, country. Anti, so if we, if we had more competition, law, if our government allowed that, for more domestic competition, then we would not worry. This, this, it's a government caused but, issue but that the cartel's is, power. That is the argument for antitrust law. There is no competition because companies buy up the competition, and you can't prevent that without, yes, I'm sorry, government regulations that prevent these massive mergers that mean that we only have like four. Uh, you know, eyeglass companies in the entire country, and, and we have this diversity of labels on our products in the supermarket, but they're all made by the same three manufacturers. We only have four major meat manufacturers in the United States of America, and that's Inevitably why the meat and industry invariably because of government policy that prevents competition. No, Robbie, because we don't <laughs> Every time. have no, Robbie. Literally, we we it's because we don't have the antitrust laws that that prevented. <laughs> that's ridiculous. That, that's that, totally ridiculous. That prevented those kinds of conglomerations from coming together in the first place. That's literally what happened, and not I, mean, I don't know what to tell. You, Rob, this, that's just very much quite literally what happened. And that's why we had Biden did make an effort with some policy to try to address the gouging that was happening very specifically. Every, by the meat we talk industry. about this issue every time we talk about the um, the uh, the uh, the uh, baby formula. We, we see artificial constraints imposed by government to rent cheaper, better, perfectly good alternatives from other countries from being used here. This is true of food. This is true of energy. Robbie, there are a lot of different causes to the baby formula thing. Okay. I, there's no issue with saying, of course, you know, or, or you know, with the cursory look at safety standards. Seeking, wait a minute, private wait a minute, seeking Robbie, companies are not the point. problem, are not the main problem. Let, let me finish the point if you raise the point. There's nothing wrong with saying, cursor, once you look and make sure there's a basic safety standard being met, of course you should lift whatever barriers there are to importing baby formula okay, in a agree. crisis. But you cannot ignore that the crisis happened because of there was negligence along the line, including within the FDA, not following up on a whistleblower report of the factory not being safe. If you have, if you have the, choice. No, wait, let's not forget that the reason that that factory shut down was not because of the government, but because the factory made poisonous baby formula that killed two babies. And if we have choice and competition and we have other companies that make that product and we allow them to do that, we're not so reliant. Look, I, I think I agree with you. Right, being reliant on one big central entity, whether it's a government or a corporation or whatever, to supply the thing is risky. And we're seeing the downsides and the risks and dangers of that. So I'm not, I, I, like, I'm not disagreeing with you that that's a bad arrangement, but I see a lot of uh, a collusion and and working together between the major major firms and uh, the major firm also wants to be the only firm, and they use the government to get that and they 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 do yeah they do they well, we they have used the government by lobbying with millions of dollars to to roll yeah. back the antitrust look protections. what our pharmaceutical Yes, uh, they lobby doing. to get control of the government because they know that the government has tools to protect the people. Does the government I don't use, agree with that. Does the government use those tools? Often it does not because it is captured. That is that is the whole point. So I'm not arguing that there are not these flaws in government, but the the the, the I'm saying the, these the flaws solution, will be exacerbated solution, with a bigger and more powerful government with no, more authority the solution to isn't, crush these if I industries. Just finish this sentence. The solution isn't less government. The solution isn't letting the people who have corrupted government so that they can get their own way have a laissez-faire opportunity to to exploit the entire population. Well. I thought we were agreeing. We had serious <laughs> philosophical disagreements. Well, I don't even remember what we were talking about before we got on this subject. But meanwhile, several countries in the EU have taken to the streets to protest, to protest the soaring energy prices and voice opposition to the EU and NATO. In Germany, people gathered to protest the government sanctions against Russia and increase energy bills. In Prague, upwards of 70,000 people gathered to demand neutrality in the war and action on energy prices, while in France, resistant signs flooded the streets over Macron's handling of NATO and economic conditions. Friend of the show and leftist economist Richard Wolff heeded a warning to the U.S. over the uprising, saying it's a, quote, omen of what's to come. I don't know, Robbie. I, I, I would like to think that there was that same kind of revolutionary spirit here in the United States, but and it, I think part of what our conversation you know, un revealed, and I think many people do feel like you, is that there is this 
I'm sorry, what from my perspective is complacency and a belief that things can't be better. The best we can do is to let market actors screw the population in whatever way they can. If a government is to, to step in, we are mad at the government for intervening on their behalf. Whereas in Europe, their government is responsive enough, at least the, or some of these countries at least is responsive enough, that they're at least say, oh, we're going to cover the cost of your high oil. We have an entire city in Jackson, Mississippi, the capital city of, an, of a state in the United States of America, who is having to fight its state legislature for the funds to actually fix the, fix the water pipes so they can even have clean drinking water. We don't even have that level of expectation. So do you think we're going to have our, people in the streets protesting? Our government has stepped in, and they're in, in their stepping in was saying, we will continue this war, whatever it takes. That was <laughs> their, that was their uh, stepping in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it is... It is Interesting. We, you know, um, spoke to Nile yesterday here on the show about some of the sociological, political, cultural differences between mm -hmm. here and Europe, and why it is that I think that even though they have obviously this new conservative prime minister and these many conservative aspects of their government, they still those those conservative parties still yield a certain base level of social benefit that we don't have in the United States. Of well, I, certainly our Republican Party could learn should learn something from the conservative party of England because America, despite is is a more I would say more right wing country than England. Uh, but the Conservative Party in England is much more politically successful over my lifetime or over the last 15 yeah. years. They've been, ver they've been, how long have they been in power? Almost that entire, yeah. it's been a long time. The Republican parties have not, the Republican Party in the U.S. has not exercised anything approaching the level of dominance over our, the U.S. political system compared to the Conservative Party, even though you'd think America, the U.S. would be a more favorable landscape for a Conservative Party than the U.K. So it's yeah. very, very interesting. Lo lo lots of reasons for that, why. including, I, I'd have to say, that they they got their Marshall Plan and a certain expectation of social safety net and social support. And in the laissez-faire America, we, we've, we've I mean, learned I've, to I've never said that, that being for the social safety net isn't popular. It's certainly popular. It was Trump's uh, singular good political insight was to not run against the social safety net, and he was somewhat successful for a time. <laughs> All right, that was a fiery debate to kick <laughs> off the day. Usually we ease into things, not uh, we chose violence today. But I'm looking forward to your radar coming up next. <laughs>